Alan. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Say hello to everybody. I was on the wrong page, as usual. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the 41st episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Wednesday, the 4th of December, nearly Christmas. And in this episode, we're going to discuss what's been in the news. We'll also talk about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening or watching live, you can send us a message using the chat facility on the website. Hello to all of those on the camera and in the IRC channel. I'm Alan, and joining me this week is everyone. Tony, hello. Hi, Alan. Hello. Uh, and what? I was going to say, you all right? <laughs> yeah, fine, thank you. Uh, Laura. Hi. You all right? Yeah. Good. Mark. Hello. Good to hear from you, Alan. Good. There we go. Why, has he not been speaking to you for two well, weeks? Well, he, he didn't speak until you told him to. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always do what Tony tells us to. Yeah, I wish. Yes. What have you been up to? Oh, uh, not very much. I've been ill. So really? if I had to oh. run away at some point during this show don't ask don't oh ask. that kind of ill okay yeah yeah let's not talk about that yeah i'll draw your diagram well you <laughs> please don't actually yeah okay uh how are you doing laura i'm fine thanks what have you been up to we don't discuss that in this episode so i'm still asking you yeah. how you are what you've been up to taking it off but road. i've saved it for the other one. Oh, all right sit yourself mark are you gonna talk to me <laughs> yeah I've, I've, I've got two things to talk about so i can talk about one of them now if you want but we don't have long well Go we've run it. out of time so let's get on with the show <laughs> Now it's time for some news. Uh, first up, we've got Cyanogen Mods uh, one click installer, which we, I think, rem- I remember us announcing being in the Play Store yeah, last, <laughs> last time. Yeah. Last that was the kiss of death. <laughs> um, and it's now been removed. Oh, so there wow. we go. Oh, the Ubuntu um, Podcast Seal of Recommendation. Yeah. So it, its purpose was to direct the user to enable USB debugging to, so that the counterpoint, counterpart Windows app can perform as, oh that was it so, a cyanogen cyanogen, so cyanogen yeah. installation um it does nothing wrong apparently but it encourages fan owners to void their warranty yeah so it wasn't it wasn't removed because it because google play people thought it did something malicious mm-hmm. they just said that because it void that they, they, it's encouraging them to void their warranty then it's not allowed in the play store but how long's the but warranties are you lucky if they're longer than 12 months yeah, but the problem is you could go and buy a, a phone today and then go to the Play Store as you're standing in the shop where you bought the thing and void your warranty before you've even left the store. Can they not just put a big thing on it saying, caution, this will void your it warranty? It does do that. When you when you try yeah. and unlock your bootloader, it says, careful, this voids your warranty. Do you really, really want to do this? And surely right. it's your problem then. <laughs> well, until you start phoning up the handset, um, your carrier, so probably. Yeah, work. and yeah. Or, yeah, or you say to Google, well, the app from your store told me to do this, so I did it. Given how little money Google spend on supporting their customers, (laughs) in my opinion. uh, (laughs) Slash experience. Yeah, slash experience when I tried to get my Nexus 4 fixed and Mm -hmm. how quickly they want to get me off the phone because they clearly want to pick up the next call to chug through the customers that are clearly lots of them phoning them. Um, I can see why they don't want to be the support hub for all those people out there who've installed some random app from the Play Store, pressed a couple of buttons and found they've trashed their phone. But it's not the sort of thing that everyday users would do, is it try and install a new ROM on their phone? I don't know. It it could be if their technical expert suggests that might be a good idea. Oh, I heard my son talking about signage and mod. That looks quite good. I found it in the Play Store, pressed a button and my phone's broken. Enough to be dangerous. Yeah, exactly. And I guess the Play Store seems quite a safe place to be. Yes. Yeah, you would expect that the apps in the store are curated in some kind mm. of way. Even although, though they're not. Even though they're not. And, I, you know, neither are ours <laughs> in the Ubuntu <laughs> store. But, you know, we don't sell a phone, so we're all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no bitterness there. <laughs> no, not at all. Just a realist. That's all. <laughs> yeah, they let any old tut into the Ubuntu oh, store. They don't. I carefully monitor all the things that go in the store. Hmm. Look, we let them through, but we carefully look at them. It's not just anything which happens to be in the repository. No, no. no. I mean, you can apt get stuff into into Ubuntu Touch. Yeah, you sure you can. Oh, sorry, you're talking but, about Ubuntu Touch now. Oh, yeah. Well, you said repository, so I assumed so. Yeah, unless well, no. you, you call the Play Store a repository. No, I, I was referring to the Ubuntu Software, Software Center as ah no a repository. No, okay, okay. I thought we were talking about phones. <laughs> so anyway, the the um, Cyanogen app can still be downloaded from Cyanogen and installed manually. Yes. Yeah. So, so you can you, still yeah, yeah say 
install non-Play Store applications and then download it from their website. Right. And you get the APK and you say installed and it still works. And that's probably the level that you wanted at, really. Make it a little bit hard so that people have to actually think about it and put some effort yeah, in. Yeah, but that you know that that makes it harder for Sanogen Mod to to you know jump the chasm, as it were, and get to like millions of normals. Yeah, using their software is that their mission, though? I would imagine so. Well, I given, imagine they want yeah. users. Yeah, yeah. Given, given they're a corporation, they, they raised all that money. Yeah. from venture capital, they're obviously planning on doing something fairly big with it. So, what's the benefits of it? I can't remember much about it. <laughs> well, it's. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a version of Android without well unless you specifically select it without all of Google's play crap on top of it. Oh right. Yeah. Um and with some you know some other customizations and it's a an actual open source project which you can participate in. Sort of like Mint to Ubuntu. Mm, no. no, because if you want to contribute to Ubuntu you can, but if you want to contribute to Google's Android you can't. Yes. Whereas you can contribute to Cyanogen Mod. Mm. Interesting. Excellent. Mark, what's the next story in the news? The next story in the news. Funny you should ask. Um, Wolf Richter of testosteronepit.com has posted details of Google's ScreenWise research program in which participants are offered money in exchange for installing a router in their home, which reports details of network activity back to a research agency acting on Google's behalf. Hasn't everyone already done that? Hey. <laughs> in the form of their mobile phone and tablet. But this is actually your your sort of wireless router so any wi-fi device you have that in any traffic that's Even going through iPads. your going What's through the, your router so so okay they're offering you money yes to replace your router with their router mm-hmm. or, or put your router between routers or something so that your their router is the single box through which you get to the internet right uh, yes. essentially yes what's in it for you other than a small cash payment uh a small cash, a payment. Small cash payment in the long term Better search results, probably. <laughs> yes. Right. So yeah, they offer they offer a setup fee for you to install this box, and then they offer you monthly financial incentives to sort of um, register additional devices, so you can put like an app on your phone, which gives them even more details about what's going on than they do already. So you can't sidetrack it by using your mobile phone network. I guess so. Oh really? Mm. So yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, they basically. This is hilarious. Uh, yeah, they they offer. He worked out that if he was to basically sell all of his data and all of his family's data, the maximum that he could get was nine hundred and forty five dollars in the first year, um, assuming that the scheme continued that long. Well, that's uh, Christmas dinner said, and a good few presents, isn't it? <laughs> I can see why you, why you might. Well, okay, that's half a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> he said he considered that woefully inadequate. But he did make. <laughs> he values his his. Uh, uh, personal data way too high. But he did make an interesting point that by doing this, and they've probably got small print to say it isn't true, but he was saying by doing this, Google is basically putting a price on data yeah. and people's mm. personal data, which previously they haven't done. They've just sort of said, we deserve it because we give you these things. Mm. So he said, Well, he there said, already was a price, but, but it just wasn't you that was paying it and you that were getting the remuneration it was yes. someone else who was paying for advertising in front of your eyeballs it yeah. just yeah. wasn't as obvious but as now, it is but now, now but yeah. now it's a direct they give you money yeah. in return for so your if, data if, so you could take this through yeah so if, if google are paying you for for your data and then they're not paying someone else for their data are they then stealing their data if you if they've said well this has monetary value and they're taking it for free from other people so awesome. should the, they not be paying everyone? The big question is, what is an adequate amount? Yeah, well, he said he, the point. The point he made was, you know, what if they offered me one million? Right? Question mark. Is that was sort of where the article ended. I think he was up for it. Right. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? What price you're free? Yeah. Were there any restrictions on the fact that you had to be living in the house and using your devices? Um, Could you not put it in an empty house <laughs> and just like take the money right. and then because that would pay for a house? Right, so what a million dollars? Yeah, oh, they I give see, you a million. Right. You put it in the house. Nobody lives there, or you know, you could give it to someone else who doesn't have any kind of data device, and you're done. Win. Get, get rich quick scheme. Yeah, of I Alan think Pope. there's no flaw in that plan <laughs> at all. Mm. Anyway, moving on. Uh, comments from Microsoft senior executive Julie Larson Green suggest that they'll be killing off Windows RT. Oh, the cut down Windows OS for ARM tablets. Gutted. Oh, did mm. anybody actually use it? I'm sure some people did. I saw some Microsoft employees who used it. I did see somebody with a Surface the other day as well. Was that a Surface Pro, a proper Surface? I don't know. I've uh, used one. 
Is that any good? A Surface Pro. Ah, okay. That's... That wouldn't be IT. All right. So this is this is their version of Windows 4, the ARM, that they stopped doing for a while, then they started to do again, and now they're stopping it again. Yeah. I think the, the only... I, th- I think I saw a, a review of Windows RT when it very first came out. And uh, the guy who was uh, reviewing it had a video camera pointing at the screen and the keyboard and was opened up Office and just started typing a document oh, like yes, you normally this. might do. Yeah. And he was just going, bah, 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 typing mm. as you normally would. And then the key, the, the letters were appearing slowly on the screen as if this was like, you know, DOS 3.1 on a 4 megahertz. Yeah. PC. It was just incredibly slow. Okay, you know, everyone has bugs and stuff, but this was a final released product by a multi-billion dollar company. Mm. And the same stores. company that produced the hardware had produced the software as well. <laughs> yeah, so they couldn't exactly blame it on anyone other than them. Well, it sounds like it won't be very much missed, but apparently the Microsoft Surface 2 and Nokia 2520 will be likely to be the last tablets released with uh, running Windows RT. Hmm. Soon to be collector's items or <laughs> if you, something. If you can find one. The 2013 Joggler. <laughs> yes, quite. <laughs> still got a garage full of those, haven't you? Nope, no, they've yeah. all been sold on no, eBay. I've still got mine oh. in a box. <laughs> Developer Mark Travis has announced Infini SQL, a new open source database combining the flexibility of SQL databases with the scalability of no SQL databases. <laughs> Some so this SQL. is not, not no SQL. It's maybe SQL. It's yes SQL. It's, it's... Bit of SQL. <laughs> yes. I was quite chuffed with that. Yeah. Yes SQL. Uh, the new database works by spreading the databases ac- across a cluster of nodes, each of which can access the data on all the other nodes. The data can data can be queried using the standard SQL 9.2 query language, and the system uses the PostgreSQL client protocols, which means that basically anything that's currently uh, written to work with PostgreSQL will just work with this as well, yeah. which is pretty cool. It is. Um, and benchmarking tests show that 12 node cluster was able to support 100,000 concurrent connections and 50, sorry, 500,000 complex transactions per second, which is quite a lot. It is quite a lot. Uh, yeah. Um, he said that the, the sort of nearest existing thing that it compares to is MySQL cluster, which is MySQL designed to be run across distributed nodes using a special storage engine. Um, so what's SQL? SQL, um, structured <laughs> query language. It's yeah. the language you use for getting data at, from and putting data in relational databases. Yeah, like uh, select clue from Tony. Yes. No, yes. I used to have that teacher. Drop tables students, yeah. that sort of thing. Yes. No, no, I, I meant the uh, SQL database versus a no SQL database. So a no SQL database, um, well... It's not one thing. It's a sort of term used to refer to several different databases. But essentially, they are um, ways of storing non-relational data. Like you just have like an object with some properties and you stick it somewhere. And it the, the systems are designed to be very scalable. And they're used for things like Twitter and Facebook, where you've got lots of data coming in all the time. And you're just concerned about it being able to scale very well rather than you having... Um, like your data normalized and efficient and easy to query. Mm. So a hybrid of that would be interesting. Yes. So this is supposed to be basically supposed to give you the best of both worlds. So you have the, the scalability, uh, but you also have the ability to store everything in a normalized form and do complex querying on it. And kind of backward compatible with existing. SQL. Yes, of course. Yes. What's a normalized form in this case? Um, Norm, so the, that basically a normalized database is a database that never stores the same piece of data twice. Ah, uh, okay. So mm-hmm. you have a, you have tables of entities, and each entity is only stored once in each table, and then they're just linked together. Yeah. Whereas in a NoSQL database, you might have so you might have a tweet, and it might store the person who posted the tweet against each tweet. Ah, uh, right. Rather so than having a table of users table. and a table of tweets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, the current version of Infini SQL lacks redundancy and stores all its data in memory, which is absolutely fine, <laughs> meaning it isn't currently ACID compliant, which yeah. is, in fact, the web browser standard for no, drawing no. faces. Different ACID. Oh. Different uh, ACID. Atomic and then other bits. Yeah, ACID right. is like, it's the the sort of standard set of tests for data integrity. So, you know, it's whether you should trust it with your data or not. So most NoSQL databases aren't ACID compliant because they care about being fast and scalable rather than being reliable. So it's a database you can't trust with your data? At the moment. Yes. At the he's, moment. he's working on the, the um, details. The redundancy details and <laughs> he just wanted to, I think at the moment, it's more of a proof of concept. This can be done rather than put this in production now. Okay, excellent. Laura? There's going to be a new kind of USB connector. Woohoo! 
Just what we always wanted to hear. Oh, yeah. no, I do. I do. I hate all USB connectors. Me too. So all what, of them. What they you all, need is a new they one. They all suck. Yes. They should all be burnt and we should start again. So the really cool thing about this one is that it'll be a teeny tiny one like a standard phone connector. And, and, and it'll be more usable because you won't have to put it in in a certain orientation. Yeah, it's reversible. That's the big thing that I, oh. I hate, I have like seven mini USB devices on my desk that I'm constantly plugging and unplugging and moving around and debugging. And they're all debugging. different orientations, aren't and, they? And yeah, even like two Google devices, the Nexus 7 and the Nexus 4, have their USB-B um, connectors up. Different ways. A different way up. It's completely wow. demented. And they all, it's not just mini USB. Sorry, I'm getting on my USB. <laughs> right. I hate USB. Go for it. But USB-A is is rubbish because it's exactly the same size as an Ethernet port, and you can very easily yes. slide it into an Ethernet port. You can't you can't shove it in you know both ways, and all manufacturers tend to put the USB logo on the wrong side. It's supposed to be always on the top. Some manufacturers of laptops even put the USB ports upside down or back to back or side by side by side, and not enough clearance between them for you to put two mm. things in. It's just rubbish, utterly rubbish. I read an interview with the Intel engineer who developed USB saying that he wanted them to be reversible but they had to make them non-reversible for economic reasons because he wasn't allowed the money to invest in getting the orientation thing and the, sw- the, the switching uh, between the different voltages or make that automatically part of the chipset. Right. Rubbish. Utter rubbish. Yeah. So this will be the Type-C connector. Yeah. I think I'm going to set a benchmark now. I am not buying a new laptop until it has this new USB connector which is going to be the middle of next year or later which conveniently is when the warranty on this runs out <laughs> <laughs> given how often that laptop blows up it might be a big ask <laughs> yes and uh, we've got some gaming news now everybody Ooh. do tell us tony um well absolutely it's a very exciting piece of news about um the valve company the company behind steam uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, who we talked about quite a lot on this show before yeah um, well you a, have yeah yeah well Being I, gaming I can't, expert can't yeah. stop talking about them um they've joined the linux foundation Ooh. Which is good. And if you don't know what the Linux Foundation is, it's a non-profit organization which supports and promotes Linux. You might guess that from the name, really. Um, they pay Linux Torvalds. They do. Among other things. Yes. They don't just, yeah. Um, and uh, basically they hope to, you know, contribute to uh, tools for developers, building new experiences on Linux, and compel hardware manufacturers to prioritize support for Linux and ultimately deliver an elegant and open platform for Linux users, they say in their press release. <laughs> um, cool. Oh. And uh, their CEO, Gabe Newell, has previously referred to Linux as the future of gaming. Um, which is yeah, they really put out a nice uh, video promoting this uh, when um, uh, earlier on today when they joined. And um, it's a nice little video cut together of Gabe uh, on stage at a recent conference where he was talking about how uh, Linux is the future. And then it cuts to uh, Linus Torvalds showing love for Valve as well. So right. it's, it's a nice little video that shows the, you know, how the synergy of the two points of view of Valve and, and Linus himself. Cool. Well, I know that you know, all the big gaming heads out there like me will be very excited about this news. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Excellent. Is that the end of the news? I think yes. that is the end of the news. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that tickles, titillates, or taunts you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. We really would like to hear from you. So go on, do your duty, keep calm, and compose an email. It's time for the community news, all the latest things that have been going on in the Ubuntu community and kind of around it as well. Mm. Um, And there's been a very interesting tutorial on using user metrics, the component which allows apps to display messages on the welcome screen in Ubuntu Touch apps. So so this is by uh, somebody called Adnane Belmadiaf. Yes. I'm really ill. I I still managed to say that. Um, So... The welcome screen is like the landing page when you turn your phone on. Yeah, on Ubuntu Touch. It's, the, it's the like the fancy dot, circle thing. The fancy yeah. circle thing with mm. the big circles around it. So the it might, welcome screen. It might show things like how many text messages you've got or tweets or something like that going on. Well, not, not how many you've got. It's a historic, it's, it's like a personalized um, information screen 
um, that will be different for each user, hence personalized. Right. So mine might show how many music tracks I've listened to or how many miles I've walked or how many tweets I've sent or SMSs I've received. Be how many hours of games he's played. Yeah, or how many yeah. photographs he's taken. Or how many photographs he's taken. Or yeah. how many episodes of Doctor Who he's watched. Or, <laughs> you know, it, could, it could be anything. And that and that's that's one of the cool things about it is it's extendable. It's, I mean, out of the mm. box, it's got the ability to show you uh, SMS in and out and phone calls in and out and um, number of photos taken per day. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the music app guys um, added in user metrics for music app. So it tells you how many tracks you've played each day, cool. which is quite cool. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, tutorial shows how other developers can add the same functionality into their app. So you can all push information to the welcome screen. Nice. Yeah. Is there a risk of there being too much stuff being pushed to that screen? How well, it only work? shows one thing at a time. So oh, okay. when you when you first turn the phone on, it might show you know how many SMSs you receive. But if you just double tap on the screen, it redraws it with something else each time, and you don't actually specify what it is that it shows. It's it, just random. Well, yeah, it may well be. Oh, it cycles through them. It may well be that there'll be a setting later on in the future where you can you know say I want to show S, uh, um, how many tracks I played or how many photos, but I don't want to show when I've had SMSs or phone calls or something like that for whatever reason. Yeah, um, um, but I don't know whether that's on the roadmap but that that could happen uh, but at the moment it doesn't you just double tap and it changes to something else it's quite cool excellent mm. well that sounds interesting mark what's next uh elizabeth krumbach is seeking quotes from the ubuntu community members for the community.ubuntu.com website 25 pounds that's my quote you're going to make a website for 25 pounds no no she's just looking for quotes uh, my quote <laughs> is 25 so yeah pounds. she wants people to to basically Don't say plan. why they're why they're involved in the Ubuntu community or what they do or what inspires them about Ubuntu. Yeah, she's asked it after short one to two sentence quotes from community members answering the questions, what do you work on and why? Or perhaps what inspires you about Ubuntu? So fairly simple questions to ask. Yeah. yeah. And answer, hopefully. And uh, how do you get in touch? Where, where are people sending these? Uh, you can email them to her at oh, cool. uh, liz, L-Y-Z, at Ubuntu.com. And we'll put that in the show notes, I'm sure. Well, we'll link to the, uh, the article where oh, it gives a bit, a bit more detail about what, uh, what uh, Elizabeth is looking to do. Uh, but basically, she's looking to scatter them about the site. So feedback from folks from a variety of teams will be super valuable. Which site is this going on? The community.ubuntu.com site. Ah, okay. So this is the website that when we were, we were talking about the website design and some people were up in arms about the, work, the link community mm. the was that got, pushed to the bottom of the website. Yeah, the one that got relaunched earlier this year following a redesign. Right. And yes. So it's community.ubuntu.com, I think. Yeah, it's a nice website. idea. Yeah. So if you've got any you know, nice little quotes you can say about why you enjoy working on Ubuntu, what, what's special about it for you, then uh, let Liz know. Awesome. Canonical has announced two new affordable laptops from Asus aimed at the US education market. Uh, one model is priced around $250 and one around $350. Cool. So these Ooh. are sort of little mini laptops, so, uh, one's 10 inches and one's 11 inches. I noticed you didn't say netbook then. You said mini laptops. Yeah, because netbooks are under 10 inches. Oh, uh, this is 10.1. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Cool. They do look rather nice, actually. Yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah, and they come with Ubuntu pre-installed, which is nice. Which is always a which, which version? Uh, I think uh. it's, th- well, one, one, the one place I found which specified the version said it was 13.04. But right, most okay. places just say Ubuntu, so That's, it's a bit yeah. opaque. But yeah, that does seem odd to sell it with, because now it's, 1304 is only supported for six months, isn't it? Uh, eight, 18, 18, I think. 18, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I thought non-LTS Alan releases looks look blankly. Right Quick look at Wikipedia, that tells you. Yeah. No. I, think, <laughs> I think it's 18 months. But yeah, it does seem weird not to, so that, that website I was reading from may have been spurious. Yeah, it's strange that if they have gone for 1304, it's not an LTS release. Yeah. But um, actually, no. It is. 1304 is uh, from, it was released on April the 25th, 2013. Yeah. And end of life, January 2014. Nine oh, months. wow. Nine months. Nine months. Oh, there we go. Okay. So wow. it's, it's halfway through the next release. We were yeah. all wrong. So, yeah. but, but obviously, the first thing that's going to happen when, when you boot that thing up is it's it, going to say, there's a new release of Ubuntu. Yeah, yeah. you should upgrade to 1310. Which um, is kind of a bad experience. The first thing you have to do is. Yes, Down upgrade. 400 oh, no, megabytes. In fact, of... no, I tell you where I saw this. It was um, someone selling one second hand on eBay. So it could be that they had upgraded it. Okay. Hmm. Still. Interesting. So somebody's already flogging them on eBay. <laughs> yeah. I saw one of each model on eBay. <laughs> right. Okay. 
Hmm. Well, it's nice to see Ubuntu boxes getting out there yeah, in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and in a mainstream retailer, Amazon, by a well-known manufacturer, Asus. Yeah, yes. and it's nice that Asus haven't completely given Linux the heave-ho. Yeah. yeah. Because it did look like they were doing it at one point. And they do look nice. I mean, one yeah. of them particularly yeah. looks like an ultra-portable. I mean, it hasn't got the, the grunt of a proper, let's say, a MacBook Air, um, but it has got the look of one. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, nice and light to get in your bag. It's always nice to see machines in the wild, you know, ship out of the box with Ubuntu. I like that. Yeah. And the upcoming 14.04 LTS release of Ubuntu will include an option to whitelist or blacklist certain apps from using the global menu via the deconf editor tool. The edition comes as the Unity GTK APIs no longer allow app developers to prevent apps from using the global menu in their code. Alan will now explain to you what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so the global menu is the Mac style menu at the top of the screen, um, rather than being inside the frame of a win- an application window, right? Yeah. And by default on Ubuntu, um, or since Unity has been around, uh, all apps have their menu in the top bar, mm-hmm. uh, and this allows you to choose whether an app will be using that global menu or not. So as a user can go in and say, I don't want that app to use. Yes, by although you do have to install Deconf Editor, find the thing, and then put the name of each app in the list of apps, which is blacklisted or whitelisted. Well, you, you can do it that way. Or I'm sure someone like the guys who make uh, Unity, Tweak. Unity Tweak or yeah. something like that will no doubt add a, an option in there where you can tick boxes and press buttons. Mm, yeah, cool. We're just putting the underpinnings there that make it so that that works. Um, So why would somebody want to do that? uh, So weird. You know, people keep, (laughs) do you know what? It's, it's funny. You you know, if there's not enough options, it's people complain that there's not enough options. You add an option. Too many options. Why are you adding that? It's like, okay. Well, I mean, this isn't KD. As somebody who uses, (laughs) um, focus follows mouse, um, the global menu is a bit of an issue sometimes. Yeah. I filed a bug about that. (laughs) Mm. The first day I used Unity, actually, I think, uh, before I was a canonical employee many <laughs> moons ago, uh, but I filed a bug about that because it's still open though. It's yeah, it is yeah, uh, because yeah, I used to use Focus. I just realised well. I don't use Focus Follows Mouse anymore. Mm. I used to really, it's funny, isn't it? but I, I seem to remember having an argument about this at one point, mm. and I was really bloody mindedly for Focus Follows Mouse, and now I don't use it. I think because I use the keyboard to switch windows now. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. I used to use it like really intently to the point that when i was at work in my previous job and i was on windows i would install a focus follows mouse uh, (laughs) thing on windows so that i could do the same thing because i used to have like my irc window behind like a browser or behind a document yeah and you know i'm in the middle of working on a document and someone will say something to me on irc and all i've got to do is nudge the mouse over towards the, mm. the IRC window and type a reply and then nudge it back again and carry mm. on typing my document. And, you know, it, it, it's a very lean and fast way to, you know, switch yeah. without having to switch the whole desktop or switch, you know, the screen to actually flick between one app and another. It's very quick. And I used yeah. to really enjoy it. I don't know why. I guess I maybe worked around it by having two screens now, <laughs> which is kind of a heavy way, to, way of doing it. Learning to use Vim has made me more keyboard-centric in general now, so... Well, before we move on to the Not About Ubuntu, Crazy George in the RC channel. He's crazy. Is a fantastic name. <laughs> um, is asking whether those Asus laptops are available in the UK. And as far as we know... Uh, I don't think they are at the moment. No. But you can get them from Amazon. So if you can ship them to somebody yeah, in the US... There was, there was one site I found that sold them and shipped and said they were shipped them to the UK, although they were the same price in pounds as they are in dollars. Always the way. Yes. So not directly, but... You know, watch this space. I mean, don't actually rely on us for information, but you know, <laughs> no, you totally should. Keep your eye out. The mind by Dude, next seriously. Time. Yeah. Okay. They're not about Ubuntu, Laura. I have no idea because my thing won't connect. To oh, the no, mine won't either. Oh. Well, Alan can tell us. I can tell you. Oh, oh there if Alan's go. still scrolling. No, no, I'm. I'm oh, okay, there. go for it. Uh, Linux Mint released version sixteen, codenamed Petra, based on Ubuntu thirteen ten and featuring the Cinnamon desktop. Well, congratulations, Linux Mint. Yes, absolutely. What's the Cinnamon desktop? Uh, it's the one which is uh, um, looks a bit like the Gnome 2 style. I thought Mate was the one which looked like the Gnome 2 style. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> or, I, or no, wait, Mate, Mate, Mate is the one which is Gnome 2, isn't it? Maintained by the community. 
not that by the to- Gnome Project. Th- I'm looking at the screenshot and it looks totally like Gnome 2. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm getting it. It's got a button it. down in the bottom left-hand corner. It's got things in the bottom right-hand corner. Well, it looks, looks like more, Windows XP, to be honest. Maybe more like XFCE than Gnome 2 to me. But yeah. Maybe Linux Mint is just a succession of identical desktops, each with a different name. <laughs> All looking like Gnome 2 from 1997. Well, you know, when we had uh, when we were at Odd Camp and we were talking about, you know, what distro are people are using now and what desktop are they using, there were a number of people who put their hand up and said Cinnamon on Mint. So, yeah, you know, it's quite a lot. It's getting a fair user base. So, maybe maybe, you know. maybe one of us should actually try it so we have some idea of what we're talking well, about. Well volunteered, Mark. Oh, dear. <laughs> what did I do that for? Yeah, you should do a review of that. Yeah. Yes. Happy that Christmas. Be our, our Christmas sketch. <laughs> Mark uses <laughs> Linux <laughs> Mint. <laughs> You think it's going to be that comedic? It could be a I Christmas. I have no game. idea. It might be. I might be converted and have to leave the podcast. Yeah, but we let him in when he was using KDE, so only barely to convert him. <laughs> <laughs> now he's converted. It's fine. Anyway, uh, we have an event. Do we? Ooh. Education Freedom Day will take place on the eighteenth of January. Okay. Uh, the event seeks to raise awareness of free and open source software for use in education, as well as open educational resources. And you can find out more and register a team, as you might do for Software Freedom Day, at educationfreedomday.org. Is this the same people doing... Yes. Ah, okay. The, I can't remember what they're called. I, yes. The, yeah, Software Freedom Foundation or something. No, the, 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 it's something Freedom Foundation. But they're doing it for education. Yes, they're doing one for education. They do, they do it, there's, I think there's three or four uh, Freedom Days now. Yeah, there was Document Freedom Day. Yes. Uh, yes. And now there's an education one. Yes. Focused at schools, cool. presumably. Uh, schools and universities and so on. Oh, uh, cool. Excellent. So we'll put a link in the show notes. If you want to get involved and help promote Linux and open source software, you can do that. Super. I'm ill. <laughs> That's all for this episode. Join us next time when hopefully Tony will be better and we'll be discussing my latest gadget, reading your feedback and making your life a little bit more interesting with some command line love. Excellent. I, complete, I completely forgot we were doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Momentarily. Thanks for listening. Just Hope you get better soon. Thanks. I hope see I'm better you next for week. next week. Yeah. yeah. Well, we shall see. <laughs> anyway, cheerio. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.